Hi, my name is Mike Davis. I am the founder of Archangel Professional Leadership or www.hillguardian.com. I want to welcome you to our podcast again today. Today, we're going to be talking with another public servant leader. His name is Henry Reyes. Now, I know Henry personally. He's a great guy. I had an opportunity to work with him. And I want to, wanted to make sure that he was on our podcast today because he's got a lot to say. He's um, a great leader. He's advanced his career throughout the years. He's worked from the ground up, promoting all the way from deputy sheriff all the way up to chief. And so we want to hear from Chief Reyes today. I may call him Henry because he's a friend of mine, but again, we want to make sure that we, we give him the proper title. And he is Chief Reyes, and he'll always be Chief Reyes, but he's Henry to me, and I hope he doesn't mind if I call him that. So actually, Henry, you're going to be uh, leading off our, our series in uh, Leadership and Legacy. So really happy to have you today. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, my name is Henry Reyes. I'm currently a Chief Deputy with the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office in Fort Worth, Texas. I've been here for about three years. Prior to that, I was with the Bear County Sheriff's Office in San Antonio, Texas for a little bit more than 17 years. And while I was there, I rose to the ranks starting from detention officer, and I left there as a, as a deputy chief. Henry, um, how long had you been in public service? So I actually started my career in public service at the age of 19 in 1999. And like a lot of us that work in jail operations kind of got there by accident. Uh, I was 19 years old and needed a job, and my choices were the military or trying to get a job in local government, you know, because of the benefits and, and a lot of the, uh, the advantages of working in local government. And I was fortunate enough to land a job with the sheriff's office, and 17 years later, you know, I, I, you know, I found myself there and, and had the opportunity to work in, a various, in various different roles and, and given some big projects and small projects and really learned a lot. Um, about public service and specifically about leadership while I was working there. That's awesome, Henry. So, you know, you got to work around uh, different elected officials in different, uh, in different positions. You know, was there any time that you can think about maybe when you were growing up, when you were young, right, right when you're late teens and, and uh, you're about to go into a, a real career field, um, was there any person or individual, anybody that, that mentored you or anything that just stuck out in your mind that you reflect on now um, that might have been an influence in, in your career path? Absolutely. Um, you know, growing up, I grew up on the west side of San Antonio. It was, it was a rougher area. And admittedly, our relationship with law enforcement, and I say our relationship, it's the community's relationship with law enforcement, what generally wasn't positive. The only time we saw police officers uh, was during emergency situations or when somebody was being arrested. So our interaction was was, um, was sort of negative. Uh, as I got older and, and I moved to different parts of town uh, for high school, the my interaction with law enforcement was, was still limited. And so the biggest influence in my life were actually my high school teachers. Uh, I had really close relationships with them. I was one of those latchkey kids. My parents worked from eight to five. And so I was at school and then I had to go home and make sure everything was playing before mom and dad got home. Um, so I developed a really close relationship with my teachers and they really helped guide my life. And, and initially I was on a path to, to being a teacher, uh, but life happened and, and I kind of had to respond to that and, and ended up in, in uh, working for the sheriff's office. And so in essence, you, you are still somewhat of a teacher. You decided to become a supervisor and when you got that opportunity, how did that come about in your very first supervisory role? How did that happen? So working at the sheriff's office in San Antonio, I wanted to be a lot more involved in the decision-making process. I was happy with the job that I had in the role in the agency, but I, I wanted to be involved. I just had the, the natural desire uh, to constantly learn and grow as an individual and as a professional. And, and like I said, wanted to be involved in, in the day-to-day -day operations as far as decision making goes. Um, so within the agency, we didn't have a, a mentorship program, a formal mentorship program. You kind of had to latch on to a, a senior officer and you know, kind of force them to mentor you. Um, and the recommendations I got were, if you wanted to be involved, um, try to promote. You know, If you wanted to be a, a part of the solution, then promote and, and you have, I guess your voice is a little bit more heard and, and your span of control, your span of influence is uh, extended and so that was what I did in 2001 I believe I took my first step and I promoted to corporal um, 
and then from there, I just started promoting every couple of years. So Henry, what was it like? You know, I mean, do you think that um, when you uh, when you thought of the idea of being able to be an influencer, or decision maker, as a supervisor, um, what kind of training did you go to? Do you think that you know it really did prepare you for some of the some of the challenges that you were going to have once you were in it? So you know, the agency I was with before, there is a little bit of training that everybody has to go to in order to meet the criteria to test for promotion, and that's really basic. Uh, that's just getting your intermediate and your advanced licenses. But a formal training program or a formal program that prepared you to be a supervisor, we didn't have one. So what would happen is you would test for promotion, and if you were fortunate enough to get promoted on a Friday, then Saturday you were just kind of thrown in the water and it was a sink or swim type of approach. And right. It's my understanding that that's actually still used, not just in the agency I was, I was in uh, before, but in a lot of agencies across, uh, across the world. And, you know, that's because of funding and, and the availability of staff. So for me, no, there wasn't any formal process that helped me transition from being, uh, from moving into a line position into a supervisory position. And, and a lot of that had to be done on your own. And you had to be self-motivated to seek out training opportunities to, you know, to invest in your own formal education um, to, to get that exposure. Uh, so it was tough and, and it was scary, especially at the beginning when, you know, think about it. I was 19 years old when I started the department. I was 20 when I moved into my first uh, supervisory position as a corporal, 24 as a sergeant. Um, at 24 years old, I, now I was being put in charge of situations and also being held accountable for the actions of other people. And at 24 years old, I mean, what did I know? And without any type of formal training, it was scary and, and there was a huge learning curve. Um, and I think that that's what kind of makes or breaks you. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm just kind of saying that that's just, it is what it is. And in an agency that doesn't have a formal process for preparing people to be supervisors. Wow, Henry. So, you know, once you're in it and you became a supervisor, you know, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced? You, even as a young uh, deputy over there, as a young corporal or moving up as a young sergeant, what were some of the toughest challenges that you decisions that you had to make or relationships or, or things you had to learn? Well, I think that the two main challenges that come to mind are the first, which I stated, is uh, being held accountable for other people's actions. Those people who are under your charge and under your supervision, you're ultimately held accountable for what they do wrong if you fail to hold them accountable. And that's tough, especially for somebody who had never been in a supervisory position. Um, and the other one really is kind of overcoming that the the different generations of employees that exist in law enforcement and in corrections and being somebody, like I said, with no formal training as a supervisor. And at that time I had limited formal education, um, but overcoming that, those generational gaps. Think about it, 24 year old Sergeant, I'm supervising people who had worked for the department longer than I'd been alive. And so now they're taking, and I've heard it before, they're taking orders from this kid who has a different pace, has a different understanding of the world, has a different view of the world, different view of operations. And so with, and so trying to find a way to adopt a style of leadership or even be flexible across different styles of leadership to, to respond to the different generations was, was really tough. And that's something that I, that I struggled with for a number of years. Um, and you know, thankfully I was successful in, in you know, understanding how to work the generational gaps and, and different styles of employees. But I attribute a lot of that to formal education and then outside training that I saw either, you know, in, saw it on my own or that my, my agency eventually invested in after I had been in a, in a supervisory position for a while. Right. And so you mentioned training and, and that's really important right now is, is um, focusing on training, especially from an administrative perspective to developing new leaders. You've been through a lot of formal training and congratulations because I know that you are a recent alumni of the uh, elite FBI National Academy. There's my, you can kind of see my brick back here, my yellow I, brick. I can <laughs> see it. You're in the yellow brick. So congratulations for that. But, um, you know, throughout uh, a lot of the training programs, um, what were some of the, I mean, what are some of the training recommendations that you would recommend? Are there any books or any, anything that maybe a line officer, somebody who's coming into the career field might uh, be able to invest without, maybe going to the FBI National Academy. Yeah. And obviously, if they get an opportunity to go, it should be, it, that's a great opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, reading, 
reading is fundamental. It remains fundamental throughout your life and throughout your, your career, and especially in terms of professional and personal growth. And so you, you, you had asked about what are some books. Um, the first, well, for me, it's the Bible. And so whatever, whatever it is, whatever your spiritual beliefs are, you got it, that keeps you grounded. My, my experience is that it keeps you grounded and you should turn to your faith in times of need and it, you know, when you're going through stress, but it also gives you um, some perspective, great perspective on, on being a servant leader. Uh, so if it's not the Bible, whatever, whatever, whatever your spiritual scripture is, that, that's what I would recommend, number one. Uh, another book I would recommend is called Staying Well by Dr. Uh, Spinaris, and that is actually specific to corrections. And it's hard to find literature that deals with officer wellness that is specific to working in a jail or prison environment. Uh, so that's a great resource. It's a, it's a quick read. You can probably knock it out in one afternoon. Um, and then another one is a Strength Finder by Tom Ross. Uh, that one is, it doesn't just focus on leadership, but it focuses on understanding who you are as a person, which I think is fundamental to, to, to adopting a leadership style that, that really complements who you are al already. Uh, there's also a lot of free uh, resources online. One of the things that I like to do is, are TED Talks. I like to listen to TED Talks, and I find um, TED Talks that deal with management, supervision, leadership, um, self-development, and I'll listen to those in the car on the way to work or at home. Uh, but what I think is key is really to expand the areas that you're, you're learning in, and not to just areas where you're comfortable, but look for areas that cause you to be uncomfortable, because you know we all know that where comfort ends, growth begins, right? So if, if you're only reading, reading or learning about things that align with your personal beliefs, um, then you're not really growing. So I would challenge people to look for books and articles, magazines, podcasts, whatever they are, that go that are contrary to the, your, your, the beliefs that you hold. Uh, you don't have to agree with who, the person who's on the other end of the video or the author of a book you're reading, but I think that taking time to understand or see their perspective in any situation, whether it's a social issue, um, a policy issue, really helps you grow as a supervisor and gives you a unique perspective on a number of, of uh, situations. It's fantastic, Henry. Thank you so much. Let me ask you this question. Um, you know, you, you've had a great career. You're still in the, in the public service field. You actually um, have a family that's also in the public service field. Right. You have your spouse is also a, a uh, law enforcement commander in, in the criminal justice uh, field as well. So, so thank you to you both for your service and everything that you both do. And um, what, what is something that you feel that you just felt so accomplished that you've been able to leave behind? You've worked in a series of organizations. What's your biggest accomplishment as a supervisor been? Yeah, you know, I, I believe, uh, I have a, a deep rooted belief in servant leadership, and that's really putting the needs of other before, others before myself. So my biggest accomplishments are actually not things that I accomplished, but seeing other people accomplish stuff. Now that, that may sound kind of corny, uh, but it's true. When you're able to use a position of leadership, the rank that you're, you're fortunate enough to serve in, to inspire others and to serve others and to meet the needs of others, for them to realize their potential, in my opinion, in my experiences, that's really the most rewarding thing you can do. Um, you know, having stars and bars on your collar, that's all great. But if you're not using that position, and that the, the power that's inherent with that position to help others grow, then, then you're really doing a disservice, not just to your agency, but, but to the future uh, of that position and other people who hold that position. So I have a number of people that I still mentor. Uh, and when I see them you know, graduate from college with their next level of degree or um, achieve professional certifications or promote or move into a career field that aligns more with their calling, and, uh, and I'm fortunate enough to get that feedback from them. And they say, you know, things like, hey, I did this because you pushed me or, you know, you gave me some advice. For me, that's really the most rewarding thing. Um, as a leader, it shouldn't be about you. Um, it should never be about you. It should be about serving others and using the position uh, to empower others. Uh, so for me, that's just the most rewarding thing, seeing other people succeed. And so you, you brought something up, uh, you talked about mentorship and, and thank you again, because we hope that this video um, will serve as, as an avenue for, to inspire other future mentors. But let's talk about the next generation. What are we leaving behind? So if you had an opportunity to talk to uh, maybe 100,000, 10,000, 10 children, 10 young people who are getting ready to, to um, right now in a pandemic, you know, when, when, when you're thinking about what 
career field or what's a, a rewarding vocation, you had an opportunity to talk to them. Henry, what would you tell them? You know, it's funny you ask that. I, um, you know, the agency I work at, we have about 1,500 to 2,000 officers total, and I get the opportunity to speak to our cadets before they graduate and while they're in the academy. And I have kind of this hip pocket speech that I give them, and I always try to give them five pieces of advice. And the first piece of advice that I give them is that no one will ever spend what you need or, or give you all the training that you need in your career. And what I mean by that is that the agency is going to provide a certain level of training. But of course, you know, we deal with budgets and we deal with manpower issues. So I don't want officers or, or people coming into the field to think that an agency will give you 100% of the training that you need. It becomes incumbent upon you as an individual and in how seriously you take your career to invest in yourself. And that can be, you know, your formal education or going through professional development or whatever it is. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. The agency's going to invest in you, but you got to invest in yourself. The second piece of advice I give them is to stay flexible and understand that we have to respond. We as public servants have to respond to what's going on in our environment, what's going on in our community. That policing, like you said at the beginning, policing is not the same today as it was 20 years ago. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way we're perceived on television, um, the way we're perceived by the public, whether there's a, a disconnect between us and the community. And that's going to vary from, from community to community. But you got to stay flexible. The other one is to have a plan. If you go into this career to make a bunch of money, then you're going to fail. I, I don't think anybody's going to get rich in, in public service, or they shouldn't get rich in public service. <laughs> but you got to have a plan. Where do you see yourself in, in two years, three years, four years, five years, ten years? Um, and hopefully that's to invest with an agency and, and invest for the long term with an agency and learn every nuance of that agency uh, uh, that you can. So when you promote, you're able to give that perspective that, that, uh, that money can't buy, that only time will give somebody and you can give a historical perspective on an agency and give some insight that really makes you um, uh, invaluable as a, as a, as a resource. Uh, the fourth one, the fourth piece of advice I always give people, it's kind of funny and it, it's simple, but at the same time, it's, it's hard for people to do, and that's be nice. Uh, and people say, well, what does that mean? And when I say be nice, it doesn't mean let people walk all over you, you know, be a pushover. It really just means be respectful for people. Understand uh, people's differences, appreciate the differences, and use those differences to bring, you, bring people together and, you know, and to connect with other cultures. But being nice is probably the easiest thing and the hardest thing at the same time that someone can do working in public safety, and especially in, um, in a supervisory position. And the last piece of advice I always give people is, is just to remember that there's no money back guarantee in leadership. And what that means is you can do everything right for someone. You can go out of your way for someone. You can bend over backwards for someone a hundred times. And you're going to run into instances as a leader and as a supervisor, as a manager, where people are still going to, you know, have you wake up with egg on your face. And what that means is that time that you invested, those resources that you invested, you don't get that back. And so when the next person comes along and asks you basically to do the same thing for them, you naturally want to say, nope, I've learned from this and, and I'm never going to help anybody out. But I would tell people, don't do that. Remember that every individual case is different and treat people as an individual uh, with respect and of course by being nice. And, you know, be a servant leader, take risks with people, take risks with situation, obviously calculated risks and, and be smart about the decisions you make. Um, but don't get frustrated when as a leader, you try to do everything right and things don't work out the way you want them to be, or want them to work out, or things don't work out in your favor. Because sometimes that's just the cost of doing business and working with people. There's just so many unknowns that we have to deal with. Um, so that, that's the advice that I would give to you guys. That's like my little hip uh, pocket speech that I give them. Well, that's fantastic advice, Henry. And so I just want to thank you so much for your time today. It's been a fantastic conversation and you definitely are one of our guardians and we appreciate your service again, you know, to you and to your family. We hope that you're staying safe. Um, and we hope to get the word out, you know, to be able to, to bring great leaders together, to be able to collaborate and to mentor the future generation. That's really what this, this is all about in this project. Um, I use the word servium and this, the word is uh, is, is, is biblical, as you mentioned, spiritual, in that uh, our patron saint or our archangel is the archangel Michael, and he's the one who called out that he would serve. And so our guardians serve, and thank you because you are serving. So we appreciate your time today.
Um, I, I'm honored to call you a friend, and I, and I loved working with you. I hope that you're safe, and, and God bless, brother. You stayed safe out there. I appreciate it, Mike. Well, once again, we want to thank our guest for joining us today. We really appreciate his time and his leadership and all that he had to say. So please come back and visit us on our website. That's www.aplguardian.com. We'll be updating our podcast. Check out our blog and participate with other guardians. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and check out our YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. So check back soon as we will update our content soon. Thanks again. Servia.